The people of the U.S. can be a mighty force when aroused, mobilized, organized. And that's why we're here, because we need to begin to mobilize. This is dangerous, a dangerous world situation. The very policies the U.S. military imposes around the world are now coming home in massive austerity, cutbacks, low wages, and always combined with war, endless war. And that changes the material basis of every struggle. It's different conditions now. Now, people in the Ukraine at the grassroots gave a monumental surprise to the coup organizers in Kiev this past month. Washington's plan was to terrorize the population into silence. That's the role of fascist shock troops. Overturn the elected government, and the fascist forces thought they only needed the backing of the U.S., an invitation to the White House, a few billion in IMF loans. It was a done deal, facts on the ground, or so it seemed. U.S. imperialism, in their arrogance, always, always underestimates the ability of people to resist. The workers in the Ukraine did something wholly surprising, unexpected. They rose up, they resisted, they're fighting back. That's important. They seized government and administrative buildings. They established their own military force. They set up roadblocks. They literally stopped the military and the tanks sent against them. The Ukrainian military disappeared. It melted away. They refused to fight their own sisters and brothers. And now U.S. imperialism has only the fascists to lean on. So what's happening in eastern Ukraine is really the first armed rebellion of this period against the banks, against the IMF, against the neoliberal program. This is the first armed resistance of a mass character it's an armed, organized Occupy Wall Street, right? Yeah. Workers all over the world will learn an enormous amount from this heroic effort. However it turns out, the importance is what is happening right now. And it's why Kiev, the capital, is suddenly flooded with CIA and FBI and mercenaries, Blackwater, Greystone, Corporate power in the U.S. is frantic that their plans are going totally awry. The U.S. government is issuing ultimatums right and left. They've turned up the decimals of war propaganda, demonization, sanctions. It's all Russian agents, Russian terrorists, Russian separatists. How, how many times, sometimes 10, 20 times in the same article, these terms used again and again and again. A determination also to lure Russia into a trap. NATO's violent, high-risk seizure of Ukraine was part of a continuing plan for the dangerous expansion of NATO. And that's what this is about. Right now, as we meet, as we speak, the biggest war games and troop maneuvers in NATO's history are going on. And Russia today had their own nuclear war game, so it's getting pretty high stakes that we need to take very seriously. In the Ukraine, key it was key to NATO's plans. They spent billions on it. They bragged about the billions they spent. The goal was ousting Russia from its military, its naval bases in Crimea, turning those into NATO bases facing Russia. That was the plan. Total conquest and recolonization of Russia. Wall Street is determined that there be no competing powers in Russia or China. It's encirclement. Those are their plans. Sanctions and threats. They wanted to seize the key industries of Ukraine, Ukrainian factories, by ending the export of critical engines and parts to Russia. Forty percent of Ukraine's exports to Russia are armaments and related heavy machinery, vital for the oil and gas industries. That's what they want to get a hold of. They wanted control of the oil and gas lines from Russia to Europe. They had lots of plans. They want it all. And the plans for the, they had plans for the people of Ukraine, too. 
What are their plans? Austerity, everything to the banks, loot the pensions, double the costs of fuel, cut the wages, make Ukraine safe for McDonald's. In Ukraine, the People's Republic of Donetsk raised surprising demands, return the industries to nationalized ownership, demand a say in economic decisions, stop the sell-off of industries, reverse what's already been done, and have a referendum so that the people decide. And their fight is our fight. It's building solidarity with those fighting fascism in Ukraine that will raise the struggle here. Now, Washington and Wall Street, they always speak about democracy, don't they? Is there democracy here? They fear democracy. They're voting, cutting, voting rights everywhere they can right now. This is a plutocracy, the oligarchs of Wall Street, the billionaires. There's no limit now on funding, Democratic or Republican Party. They're more willing to support and give funding, billions in funding, to fascist ultra-right, to monarchies, to dictatorships. They oppose a referendum in Ukraine. They're going crazy with a referendum that will take place tomorrow in East Ukraine. The referendum, I'm sorry, in Crimea and the referendum tomorrow in East Ukraine. Now, consider even Egypt backing a military coup in Egypt to overturn the first truly democratic election in Egypt's 5,000 years of history. Uh, they can't stand the idea of democracy. In Syria, arming thousands of mercenaries, the most reactionary jihadists to Syria to overturn the gover government, and it's left a third of the population dislocated, homeless, Consider in Venezuela, mobilizing the most reactionary forces in Venezuela and in Ecuador to overturn massive popular elected decisions of the people. So just in ending, they're using sanctions against elected governments, and they're supporting feudal monarchy, military dictatorships. Our role is to link the struggles, expose the corporate interests, build solidarity. We can't bemoan our small size of the movement now. That's obvious. We have to think what we can do and what our resources are and how we can mobilize. The very policies the U.S. is imposing around the world come home. This dying, corrupt capitalist system has no solutions except more prisons, more cops, more cutbacks, worse conditions. We do know that the overwhelming majority of the population in the U.S. is against another war. Every poll, three to one, five to one, against any form of military action. So I hope everyone here, when you came in, saw the call for nationally coordinated days of action, united actions, signed by almost every force in the political, social justice, peace, solidarity movement. And the overwhelming majority of the people are against another war, and we need to act with confidence and determination. The people united will never be defeated. Uh, good afternoon again. My name is Leilani Dowell, and I'm an organizer with the International Action Center. And along with um, Bernard White and Sarah Flanders, I'll be one of the co-chairs for the program today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call up our next speaker, who is Joe Lombardo of the United National Anti-War Coalition. When the Vietnam War started, everybody supported it. It was called by the media at the time the only um, consensus war in U.S. history. Polls showed that only 8% opposed it. But in the nine years of that war, things changed drastically. Uh, millions of people came out in the streets. The sentiment changed, and towards the end of the war, over 80% in this country was against the war. People didn't want to see another quagmire. They didn't want to see more war. They were tired of it. They wanted the resources to be brought home. They didn't want to see it anymore. And that sentiment also affected and included GIs. And they stopped um, agreeing to orders. And sometimes they took actions into their own hands in a more severe way. And they no longer became a fighting force in Vietnam. Um, and that war had to end. The media and the powers that be, not the movement, but the 1%, the um, uh, 
gave a term to what this uh, sentiment at that time was. They called it a Vietnam syndrome. It was a thing they disliked, they hated, because the American people didn't want to go to war anymore. They had to get over it. And of course, there was a lot of skirmishes and a lot of small military actions uh, ever since Vietnam. But it really took them to Iraq, a whole generation, before they were able to do another Vietnam type war. And that war was also a disastrous war for them. And it also changed the minds of people in this country. And although that was also a majority supported war in the beginning, but not by such a great majority, um, towards the end, uh, it was the vast majority that opposed it. And now we have an Iraq syndrome. So everything that happens from now on, um, it happens in the context of this Iraq syndrome. That is a context where people don't want to go to war. We saw some of this when Obama announced, you know, well, I'm going to go and attack Syria. I'm going to send some missiles there. We've got boats heading over in that direction. The world, the entire world, said no. And that was able to stay his hand. So by what people think and what they say is an actual force, an actual power that can stay people's hands. And we have that mass sentiment in this country right now. And that is a great opportunity and a great opening for us. The United States understands it's very difficult to put boots on the ground in any country anymore because of that sentiment. We've stayed their hand from doing that. So they look to other ways of conducting wars. They have proxies, and they have allies, and they have drones, which don't have, are, are not manned um, or women-powered uh, 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 fighting forces. They have special operations forces. And although in the last budget, they made a lot to do about the fact that they're lowering the numbers in the military, not by very much, by a minuscule amount, um, but they upped the number of the Special Operations Forces. There are 70,000 Special Operations Forces. They're operating in 75 countries in every, any given day in this country. And what are they? They call them Special Operations Forces because it sounds nice. They call mercenaries contractors because it sounds nice. These are death squads. These are terrorists. We fought the Vietnam War against communism, supposedly. Now all the wars are fought against terrorism. Even in Ukraine, the rump right-wing coup government in Kiev says they're fighting terrorists in, in the east and in the south. Imagine that. This group of right-sector fascists goes to Odessa and, and burns down and kills people in the uh, House of Labor, and yet those people in the House of Labor are the terrorists and the people out in the street that burn them down are the good guys? They have reality upside down. This is the paradigm we live in. And all the media just follows suit. And that's why we need meetings like this today. And it's one of the reasons why UNAC called for actions this month, as Sarah explained. And if you go to the UNAC website, unacpeace.org, you'll start seeing they're starting to come in and people are endorsing them. And we're surprised by all over the world people are endorsing. We were surprised that our UNAC statement that was put out only like three days ago was translated into Russia and read at the rally in Donetsk um, yesterday <laughs> to show there are Americans here that oppose what our government is, going, is doing. Um, we got another, uh, today, another endorser from uh, um, the eastern part of, of the Ukraine. Um, and we got endorsers from other countries, as well as, as um, all over this country. We have to get out and build these things, whatever size they are. You see, there's a little bit of a dichotomy between the fact that there's mass sentiment against the war, for whatever reason, if it's pacifist reasons, or people think money should be used some other way, whatever reason, mass sentiment against the war but not yet a mass movement. That's where we have to keep our organizations going. That's where we have to stay out in the streets. Teachings are great educational things to break through what the media is saying. I'm all for them and I'm speaking here today. Demonstrations are better. When we get out in the street and people see us there and they say, well, why are you doing this? Isn't it all the Russians? It is an easy argument 
to punch holes in because it's a lie. It's that same paradigm. And we can, um, and that's what we need to be doing. So our job is to be out there, is to build actions wherever we can, build teachings, forms, any kind of activity we can during this month. We will get the media because this is a big media event right now. And we will be able to tell people the truth about what's going on in the Ukraine. When we fought in Iraq, they said Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. It was a lie. Just like the lie that got us into Vietnam was the Gulf of Tonkin. They said, our, in the Gulf of Tonkin, surrounded on three sides by Vietnam, we had a little boat there just minding its own business. And then they showed us a little picture, a hole about this big. They say, you see, the Vietnamese attacked us. It turned out to be a lie. But everybody went for that, uh, um, went and, and fought, uh, said so we had to fight in Vietnam. So it's a lie in, in Ukraine, too. Um, and um, this is what we have to fight today. So I urge you to join with UNAC and the International Action Center and um, Black Agenda Report and other groups that are here today and organize um, these actions, say no to war, and let's turn this mass sentiment into a mass movement and stop this criminal government from doing the things that it's doing. I want to really, really encourage everyone to come out on May 26th. Uh, we're marching starting at 1 p.m. from Times Square. It's part of you know, the, national, um, the National Days of Action in support of the Ukraine. Post it on Facebook. Do everything you can to mobilize about, about this action. Next up, I'd like to um, introduce Greg Butterfield, the contributing editor of Workers World Newspaper. I want you to imagine for a minute a meeting, a rally, a conference, not much different than this one, maybe a little bigger. Perhaps something that you've been to in the last couple of years, like an Occupy Wall Street encampment, or an anti-war conference, or a rally against police brutality. Imagine then that your event was attacked by a thousand members of the Ku Klux Klan, armed, ready to kill, sent with the blessing of the government, with police ordered to pull back. Imagine then that these gathered activists were forced to take shelter in a union hall, and that the response of the Klan was to set fire to the union hall, killing dozens of people inside both workers from the union and the activists who were sheltered by them. What would the response be of the movement here to something like this? I ask you to think about it because that's exactly the horrifying scenario that took place in Odessa less, uh, just over a week ago on May 2nd, um, where at least 46 people were killed on that day, most of them in or around the House of Trade Unions, where activists had taken shelter after their encampment, their protest encampment, had been burned with Molotov cocktails by the fascists sent by Kiev. Most of the people who died that day actually did not die of fire or even suffocation. Many of them were shot and killed through the windows of the building by the fascists before the fire reached them. Others tried to escape by jumping from high windows. Some of them died in the fall. Some of the survivors died after being beaten by the Nazis on the ground with bats and chains. And this is the reality of the situation that activists there are facing right now. And you can see why people in Donetsk and Lugansk and other areas have taken the initiative to protect themselves, have set up their own militias to protect themselves and keep the fascists out. <laughs> there are those, uh, even on the left in this country, who are trying to stay in the good graces, let's say, of US imperialism, stay on the safe side of public opinion by drawing an equal sign 
between NATO and Russia over Ukraine, or even saying that, well, you know, Russia is so reactionary and these forces really just want to be part of Russia, the anti-fascist forces. So to hell with them, you know, if we're with anybody, we're with, you know, the Democrats in Kiev. And we say no to that. Look at the reality. Stop pretending with your insufferable Western racist imperialist arrogance that you know better than the fighters against racism and imperialism on the ground in Ukraine. The people who are fighting and dying, the people who, like us here in the US, are organizing against austerity and racism and repression. On September 11, 2002, uh, during the coup d'etat against President Chavez, I went to WBI and I said to Bernard, Bernard, we have an emergency, something is happening, we have a coup in Venezuela. And at that time, not too many people were clear about what the hell was going on in Venezuela. So we started to do several shows during the coup, when the coup was happening and after the coup. Thank you very much, Bernard, for that work. So, as you know, uh, since February 12, Venezuela has been in a very, uh, under a very sophisticated, complex coup, never seen before in this part of the air. I don't think that any other country in South America has faced so sophisticated coup, where the mainstream media, where social media, is playing a key important role. And it's so sophisticated that even people that we think that are very well informed are confused. Even people that we think that are very acknowledgeable are completely confused about what's happening in Venezuela. And it's not about democracy. We know in this room that it's not about democracy, it's not about freedom, it's not about liberty. It's just about oil. It's just about money. If we see the international, uh, several countries, um, for example, like uh, Sudan, that was a big country in Africa, was divided in two, we can see that the, most of the oil of Sudan is in Sudan, uh, the south part of Sudan. And that part of Sudan is in a civil war. If we see what's going on in Iraq, Iraq is in a civil war right now, Libya is in a civil war right now, Nigeria have a civil war right now, Iran is under huge uh, pressure from, from Europe and United States. So we can see clearly that it's oil. We can see, for example, that in the South Sea, or in the South Sea of China, Russia and China have military practices, you know. At the same time, the USA and the Philippines, they have the military practice. And this week, the USA Congress has been trying, they are trying to impose, or they passed already several, to impose several sanctions on Venezuela. Next week, they will be talking also about other sanctions against Venezuela. As I said before, we are in presence of a very sophisticated coup that they call soft coup. But the soft coup killed people too. So more than 45, 47 people have been killed and um, a big number of people have been injured. This coup, of course, is organized by the United States. And meanwhile, the United States, they don't want, let's say, be directly involved. In this moment, newspapers are performing the defamation daily work. The Inter-American Press Association organization that bring together the owners, not the journalists, the owners, businessmen that work in media, in this case of press, is doing their work under this umbrella of the American Press Association, we have three different associations. One that is called Grupos de Diarios, Periódicos Asociados, 
and, and diarios. This three group, a group, the owner of newspaper in South America and Spain, without United States and Canada. So this three group conform about around 87 big newspapers in South America, including Spain. So all of them have a campaign called "All Are We All Are Venezuela." In other words, in other words, we again Venezuela. So because every day they are publishing a page in 87 newspaper. They publish a page again, the Bolivarian Revolution. Of course, they sometimes receive support from New York Times, Washington Post, and meanwhile, they're waiting for the critical moment to attack violently to the Bolivarian Revolution. So, in, in this huge infrastructure, we have also the human rights organization that they play a very important role because they are used, they, the State Department used the human rights violation as excuse to attack other countries and they shape the political frame to be able for the State Department to attack other countries. So we can see the Human Rights Watch was the Bibianco, the one of the executive director for Latin America, was just a few days ago sitting in the Congress on one side with the representative of the State Department, and the other side he was with the former IMF director. So the IMF and the a spokesperson from the State Department worry about human rights in Venezuela with this executive director from Human Rights Watch. So we can see also that we have a very critical moment with uh, Colombia, because right now Uribe became in the first force in Colombia. We have in Colombia, Uribe has in Colombia around 20 senators. He became the second force in Colombia. And we can see the United States is just trying to gain time to be able to intervene directly through Colombia and Venezuela. At the same time, the situation in Ukraine is very critical. It's very critical because uh, Europe is going to need some oil and gas. And United States say, hey, we will, have, we will have the oil and the gas for you guys. But from where they are going to get the oil? If we remember, United States have the Iraq, the war in Iraq. Beef, uh, when they had the, uh, the war in Iraq, the, they first organized the coup d'etat against Chavez because Chavez said, we are not going to subsidize the war in Iraq. Basically, the origin and legality of the Bolivarian Revolution is insurrectional. And it's insurrectional because if you remember, in 2002 was the, a, popular, a popular insurrection that took back Chavez, Chavez to power and they are not going to eliminate that. They are not going to eliminate the insurrection of the popular people, or the, or, the, or the popular power of Venezuela. And I will say what today Nicolás Maduro said. Nicolás Maduro said, again fascism, socialism. Again fascism, more socialism. Thank you. Uh, next up, we're going to have Glenn Ford, who is really a longtime journalist, providing a great deal of important analysis with Black Agenda Report uh, and on, on so many other struggles and issues. Glenn Ford. I think that President Obama's attempt to destabilize Russia will be seen by history as as disastrous as George Bush's invasion of Iraq in 2003. Like the Iraq War, the de facto declaration of war by other means against Russia will accelerate the very dynamic that it intends to halt, the steady weakening of U.S. imperialism's grip on the world. It will increase the resolve of a host of nations to disengage themselves from American madness and to strengthen collaboration and cooperation among many countries and not just Russia and China. The result will be the exact opposite of Washington's intention. The attempt to isolate, 
and destabilize Russia, the other nuclear superpower, may appear to some to be an act of brashness, a flexing of American muscle, uh, an act of imperial overconfidence and recklessness. People thought the same thing when Bush went into Iraq. They were shocked and more than a little bit awed. In fact, sometimes I think that Americans are more shocked and awed by the American military than anybody else. <laughs> but with the Iraq invasion and the brazen offensive against Russia, as well as the so-called pivot against China, and the octopus-like U.S. military entrenchment in Africa, these are really symptoms of weakness and desperation. U.S. imperialism is losing its grip on the world and responds to its weakening condition with massive campaigns of destabilization. Destabilization uh, char uh, it characterizes U.S. foreign policy today more than any other word. The purpose is to reverse the general dynamic of global affairs today in which U.S. influence and power shrinks in relative terms as the rest of the world develops. U.S. and European hegemony, and that is the ability to dictate the terms of economic and political life on the planet, is daily diminished in myriad objective ways, ways that we can measure by the numbers. China's soon-to-be status as the world's biggest economy is just one aspect of that decline. The process is inexorable, and it's gaining momentum. The trajectory of imperial decline has been firmly set ever since the Western capitalists decided to move the production of things, that is, the industrial base, to the south and the east of the planet. Inevitably, power and influence follow, and imperial hegemony diminishes. This is, of course, unacceptable to the rulers of the United States, who now find themselves in objective opposition to all manifestations of collaboration and mutual development under terms that are not dictated by Washington. They are in objective opposition to all manifestations of independence by countries in the world. This applies not just to China, not just to China and Russia, but to the rest of the BRICS and to other developing nations. And it even applies to America's closest allies. That is because hegemones don't really have allies. All they have are subordinates. And so the U.S. is quite prepared to do serious harm to European economic interests by pressuring them to break long-established economic ties to Russia. They will ultimately do the same thing in the Pacific region with China and cause great destabilization there. They do so not because of strength, but because of growing relative weakness. Their desperation compels them to risk war because their only clear superiority is in weapons. However, the net end result, if we survive these flirtations with all-out war, can only be further isolation of the United States and the further weakening of imperialism. I think there is, on what passes for the left in the United States, a tendency uh, to describe U.S. aggressions like the Iraq War, like the current offensive against Russia, as uh, mistakes and miscalculations. They didn't mean to do that. Uh, in reality, the U.S. goes to the brink and beyond the brink of war because it perceives itself as having no other choice. Its soft power is fading. It has few other means beyond the military to strategically influence events. It recruits or buys allies where it can get them, be the jihadists or Nazis. As imperialism sway in the world shrinks, so do its options. U.S. policymakers surveyed the world in 2002 and in 2003, and they concluded that the dynamic in Asia was going against them. They knew 
that most of the world would be horrified uh, with a war against Iraq, but they rolled the dice anyway and invaded. The net result was the opposite of what they intended. The U.S. was humiliated, and the U.S. was humiliated so badly that the rulers of the United States chose to put a dramatically different face on U.S. power, uh, a black face, Barack Obama. Iraq was supposed to be a forward U.S. base in Asia to disrupt China's growing ties in the region. Instead, the Iraq war exposed U.S. imperialism's weaknesses. In the days before that invasion, uh, we wrote in Black Commentator that the U.S had reached too far and succeeded only in accelerating the process of its own decline. Today, Barack Obama is rolling the dice, just like George Bush did, to sever Russia's ties to Europe. Washington has surveyed the global scene and concluded that it has no other choice. The result will be a strengthening of ties between Russia and China a great anxiety and rethinking among Europeans about their ties to the United States, which is about to harm their economy, and an acceleration of imperialism's death spiral. Power to the people. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dustin Ponder. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a Teamster with Local 804 and a worker at UPS. I think it's only appropriate that we're in this uh, holy house because I wanted to talk about the devil incarnate uh, for working class people. And you know what they say, uh, the devil is in the details. So when you look uh, at the actual details of the Ukrainian crisis, you know, you may have heard some State Department talking points on the mainstream media that these are pro-democracy protesters protesting corruption, you know, uh, in the Euro maiden situation. That's not true. As mentioned earlier, this is an unholy alliance of fascists, right-wing neoliberals in Ukraine with U.S. imperialism. The unholy alliance. Uh, the new government's largely split between the Fatherland Party, Svoboda, and then their shock troops, uh, right-wing foot soldiers uh, in a group called Right Sector. You know, our mainstream media claim these people were fighting for democracy, but then you look at what they posted up in the government buildings, Confederate flags, pictures of Stepan Bandera, a Nazi collaborator during World War II, a mass murderer. These are the people that are in power right now in Kiev. They seized power, they suppressed their opposition through force, they attempted to ban the Communist Party and ban the Russian language with which most of the people in the South and East speak. Um, and then you take a look at who's rising up right now in the South and East in Ukraine. This is the most industrialized section of the Ukraine. The Donbass region is home to over 100,000 miners, tens of thousands of steel workers, factory workers, union workers. Uh, you know, and you look what the Kiev government's proposing, the details of what's happening. Most of you all have probably heard just recently, I think within the last two weeks, the new government has agreed to an IMF loan agreement. Uh, and this is basically austerity loans. Just a few things. This money that they're going to get, $17.5 billion, what cost does it come at for Ukrainian workers? No debt relief. They're going to have no debt forgiveness first off. They're going to float the exchange rate. What's that going to do? That's going to sink the purchasing power of average everyday Ukrainians. Inflation's going to go up. The value that people have, their money, is actually going to go down and it's going to let U.S. banks favorably buy up Ukrainian assets. Uh, they're going to remove gas subsidies. That's going to double the cost uh, for gas, 50% uh, increase to heat your home, everyday services that people spend, 10% cuts to pensions of government employees with more on the way. They're going to freeze the minimum wage, and they're going to index social benefits. Uh, you know, as some of you all may remember, a proposed plan with Social Security here, which would see social benefits cut over time. They're going to abolish import tariffs, which is going to help large agribusiness in western Ukraine, but it's not really going to help any of the Ukrainian people. Uh, and who are the big winners in all this? It's going to be Wall Street. It's going to be the currency speculators. It's going to be those that are privatizing state assets. Uh, 
The IMF has already hinted that they're going to privatize the National Gas Corporation of Ukraine, NAFTA gas. So we have to look. You know, you see the working class is flocking to the the autonomy protests in the south and east of Ukraine. They're fighting back against the fascist one percent junta in uh, Kiev. Uh, miners have been going on strike. You know, and of course we saw what happened on May second. Uh, you know, on the anniversary date that Hitler destroyed unions in Germany. Uh, 1933. That same day, May 2nd, the fascists burned down a trade union building, killing over 40 activists, uh, many left-wing activists included, uh, several children and workers of that union hall. So where are we left in all this, you know? We're left with a puppet government that is pushing through the U.S. imperialist IMF agenda to extract billions in profits from the Ukrainian people for these Western banks. Uh, with their Nazi foot soldiers who now they've enrolled in the National Guard and are invading the east of Ukraine and trying to put people down. Uh, you know, and we have to ask ourselves, how do we organize against, against this? How do we fight back? And part of it comes with going and talking to our coworkers. What's going to happen when they slash the wages of these coal miners in the south and east of Ukraine? What's going to happen to the coal miners in West Virginia? Next. The same banks who are responsible for pushing out the, these IMF loans are going to come and ask for cutbacks here. They're going to say, well, we're just going to get our coal from the Ukraine now. And in fact, most of these places you work, I work at UPS. My company is owned by all these transnational corporations, these banks, collectively. So the same people that are pushing for war, the same people who own the coal companies, own all of the industry in the United States, collectively. They all push the same agenda, and the devil is in the details. When we go back to our workplaces, when we go back into our communities, when we go into our churches, we need to point out, we need to explain who the actual villains are. We need to show them what's at stake, that it's not this uh, mythical uh, you know, pro-democracy protesters, that all over in the world, Syria, Venezuela, the Philippines, the U.S. is supporting the most reactionary, the most anti-worker elements, and it's all about driving down wages. It's all about extracting super profits from the working class. That's the bottom line in all these cases. And I did want to make one brief mention. Uh, you know, somebody had mentioned earlier that they sum up anybody who resists U.S. empire as terrorists. And that's true, and they're trying to do that effort here in the United States as well. Uh, some friends of mine in my organization have been under uh, investigation by the FBI for expressing international solidarity with people uh, resisting U.S. imperialism all over the world. I did want to mention Razmia Oda, a Palestinian rights activist, is going to trial on June 10th in D Detroit. Uh, we're asking everybody who can make it, we need you out there. We need you to show solidarity. We need to stop the government's attacks on anti-war activists and uh, anti uh, repression activists. June 10th, show up there. That's a Tuesday. Uh, and support all the, the anti-war 23 who are currently facing FBI repression. Uh, you can check that out on stopfbi.net. Uh, solidarity, victory to the working class, victory all the people fighting back all over the world. Next up, and this is an important analysis, uh, Ray McGovern, former CIA analyst, now an anti-war activist and strong voice against the war, but having an inside picture of some of the folks involved. For those of you who know what boils are like, Dr. King said, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it's covered up, but must be opened with all this pus flowing ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light, so too injustice and lies must be disclosed with all the friction its disclosure creates the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. And that's our job here, because the New York Times has fallen flat in its face one more time. It's just as bad as it was before Iraq. We ought to go occupy the New York Times after this. That's where I go. Now, 
Maybe I should pre preface this by saying that uh, when the Soviet Union imploded, it was a real downer for me. I mean, here I became a real expert on a country that didn't exist anymore. <laughs> it's a real bummer, you know? But lately, uh, there's been a sort of a call, at least in some quarters, for people who know something about Russian history, something about what happened before the, the Berlin War fell, war fell and so forth. So uh, I've been uh, basking in, in the uh, knowledge that, well, it wasn't all for naught. Uh, it still is relevant, and it sure as hell is still relevant. What the New York Times won't tell you is the background of all this. And that is that when the Berlin Wall fell in November of 1989, uh, the Russians still had a couple of troops in East Germany. Anybody got a guess as to how many troops they had in East Germany? 300,000. Yeah, right, 300,000, okay? 24 divisions. Now, would they, would they have been tempted to use those troops? I mean, they certainly wouldn't do what they did in Czechoslovakia in 68 or in Hungary in 57. <laughs> no, they, of course they would have, okay? But they had an enlightened leader, got up a chalk, the place was falling apart, and our president, to his credit, George H.W. Bush, went and met with Gorbachev in Malta at the end of uh, December 1989 and said, look, sorry about your troubles, Mikhail. <laughs> uh, uh, we realize it's kind of tough for you, but uh, I want to reassure you, we're not going to dance on the Berlin Wall. Those were his words, okay? We're not going to take advantage of your disarray, but you got to do something about those 24 divisions in East Germany. You got to get them out of there. You're not going to use them, are you? Gabrichev says, well, send Baker, send your Secretary of State over here and we'll talk about it. So in February of 1990, James Baker went over and talked with Gabrichev and with Shepard Nadze, the Soviet foreign, the, yeah, Soviet foreign minister still, and, uh, and they came to a deal. Uh, they said, well, look, uh, we need to have a reunified Germany. Now, it was already mentioned here today how many Russians died in World War II. Anybody remember? Yeah, right, okay. So, okay, you're Gorbachev, right? And you've been through that. And uh, somebody says, you want to reunify Germany now? I said, well, reunify Germany. Nobody wanted to reunify. I didn't want to reunify Germany. I lived in Germany for five years. I didn't want to see any reunify Germany, all right? I mean, there's too much history there. But Gorbachev swallowed the bitter, bitter pill, and he said, as long as you keep it uh, away from nuclear weapons, uh, keep it within the alliance, such as it is, uh, and the, the return deal was, okay, NATO will not move, well, in the, the words of James Beck, it would not leapfrog over East Germany, it would not move one inch farther eastward, okay? A promise, February 1990, okay? Now, did they write it down? They didn't write it down. For those lawyers out there like my father, they used to always say, great, get it in writing, you gotta get it in writing. Well, they didn't get it in writing. So, when Bill Clinton wanted to show how tough he was, and there were some East European countries like to join NATO, uh, why it sort of baffled me, I mean, this Warsaw Pact, which was the ostensible reason for, well, the real reason for NATO's existence in the beginning, it had fallen apart. So why do you need NATO? Why do you need to spread NATO to Georgia in the Transcaucasus? The, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization? Well, what's it doing in Afghanistan? Is it Afghanistan anywhere near the North Atlantic? And I don't think so, you know? So it was all kind of, you know, pretty contrived, and the Russians, of course, could see that. Now, the deal was, we won't expand NATO, and we welched. I mean, that's the, that's the word we use in the Bronx. We welched on the deal. We did expand NATO. Now, I want to show you uh, something from WikiLeaks that came to my attention this week. It's beautiful. Uh, it's confidential. It's a cable, and it, it speaks volumes more than you, know, you can read in a book that I can tell you here. It's a cable from Moscow, uh, classified confidential, uh, number 265, dated 1 February 2008, okay? Now, from 
American Embassy Moscow to Secretary of State Washington. Info, NATO, Secretary of Defense Washington, Joint Chiefs of Staff Washington, National Security Council Washington. Info, Baghdad for Bradley Manning. Right there, for, for, well, that, I, I made that up. But that's the kind of wide dissemination that these things would get. Bradley Manning got it, and now I have it. It's a confidential camera. What is it? <laughs> the subject. Uh, the ambassador is Bill Burns. He's now the Deputy uh, Secretary of State. And the subject that he wrote was, Niet means Niet. Russia's NATO enlargement is a red line. NATO enlargement is a red line for Russia. Lavrov, the Soviet farm, the Russian foreign minister now, is saying, look, uh, if you go to the Bucharest summit two months from now, and you invite Ukraine and Georgia into NATO, uh, well, we're going to have an emotional and neuralgic reaction to that because we favor our national security. We're not going to stand for it. It's a potential military threat. And to his credit, Burns at the end says, well, you know, uh, Russia's opposition to NATO is both emotional and based on perceived strategic concerns, while Russian opposition to the first round of NATO enlargement in the mid-90s was strong, Russia now feels itself able to respond more forcefully to what it perceives as actions contrary to its natural interests. Well, there you go, folks. They were warned. Now, of course, Bill Burns warned Washington, and so they changed their tune, right? No, wrong. Two months later, on the 3rd of April, NATO, in a solemn declaration by the Chiefs of State, said, NATO, quote, NATO welcomes Ukraine's and Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations for membership in NATO. We agree today that these countries will become members of NATO, end quote. So, two months later. Now, Russia is able to stand up for its rights now, and that was one regime change planned by the neocons who did it, uh, Victoria Nuland and, and, and John Kerry. One regime change too far, one regime change too many. Now, I want to uh, I want to just quote a little bit from Dr. King here before I uh, leave this, because I, I was uh, reading his speech on Vietnam before. I think we all realized that we cannot be silent because, as Dr. King said, silence is betrayal. <coughs> betrayal, okay? Now, why is it? Why is it that we're coveting the Ukraine, Dr. King? Increasingly, our nation has taken the role of those who make peaceful revolution impossible by refusing to give up privileges and the pleasures that come from the immense profits of overseas investments. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Last thing I'll just quote here is something that gives me a sense of urgency and I think maybe we can all feel the same sense. Uh, Dr. King says, my friends, Tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. There is such a thing as being too late. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. I want to finish by citing a concrete example of too late. Uh, Hitler's been mentioned a lot. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, what happened in World War II. We know that uh, some people were a little bit late in facing up to Hitler. We know that the, the institutional churches never found their voice. There was one Gail Lok, a geologist at the University of Berlin. His name was uh, Albert Haushofer. Anybody heard about Albert Haushofer? Good, good, good. He was like Bonhoeffer 
but less well known. Anyhow, long story short, he went along, and he could, and some some of you may know what tenure is. You know, he, he went along and he got tenure. Okay, but then he had a conscience. And he, he gathered together some people who were feeling that what Hitler, did, what Hitler was doing exactly wrong, and so he wrapped up put into jail. Now, the SS was very, very meticulous, and they wouldn't shoot you or hang you, the preferred means of execution, before you had written a confession. And Haushofer wouldn't do it. But as the Allies grew close, they shot him anyway, and as they picked him up out of the floor, whoops, out of his pocket, out of his pocket, it's a little settled. Uh, oh, it was his confession. Anybody know German? Schuld, guilt, okay? Oh, it's in, it's in the form of a sonnet. Very brief. Doch bin ich schuldig, aber anders als ihr denkt, ja? I'm guilty, but it's not what you're thinking. Ich muss da früher meine Pflicht erkennen. I should have earlier recognized my duty. Ich muss da schärfer Unheil, Unheil nennen. I should have more sharply called evil, evil. Mein Urteil habe ich zu lang gelenkt. I put off my judgment for too long. Ich habe gewarnt, I did warn, aber nicht genug. Genug? Enough. Ich habe gewarnt, aber nicht genug und klar, 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 klar. So I did warn, but not enough, and not clearly enough. Und heute weiß ich, was ich schuldig war. And today I recognize what I was guilty of. So there is such a thing as too late. This is a time, folks, where we have to stand up, we have to put our, our backs into it, I'm just very privileged to see that that's the general set, uh, sentiment here. Um, when we see what happens to Occupy in Odessa, as well as what happens here, well, we're gonna have to take some risks. The last thing I'll say is that those of you who I notice are almost as old as me, uh, judge, judging from the color of your hair, you guys have a special, special privilege and opportunity. You know why? because Americans don't like old people to get beat up. Okay. Now when I get beat up just for standing with my back to Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton got hundreds of thousands of telephone calls and emails because they didn't like a 71 year old guy with gray hair getting beat up, okay? Now they're not gonna kill, well I don't, they haven't killed any of us yet, all right? It does hurt a little bit, but you have that big advantage. Go out there, I'm not saying get beat up, but stand there, do what uh, my favorite theologian, Annie Dillard, says, you know, there's only us. There never has been any other. Let's go out and do it now before it's too late. same book. It's the desire for control, the desire for exploitation. It comes at a time when it seems particularly important to uh, U.S. aggression strategists to, uh, to not only contain Russia, but to keep a black eye in the process of doing so. so it would be harder for <coughs> Russia to appeal to its neighbors or work with its neighbors in isolation. But it's uh, shameful. The United States has uh, no military interests and no business having military presence or providing arms for others who have a presence in Ukraine uh, to cause Ukrainians to kill Ukrainians and uh, involve uh, Russia and NATO. It's a uh, protest now is of the utmost importance because we need to stop uh, <coughs> this conflict before it develops into something the whole world will regret for a long time. Another major war. And 
to stop uh, minor aggression from very late at this time. It's, it's not minor for the folks who live there, but uh, in terms of the global picture, it's critically important, particularly because it's on the border of Russia. Suppose it's Canada or Mexico. What do we do? Watch out for nuclear bombs. Push out with you. And, uh, Stand up for peace. That's it. All right. Uh, we think we can uh, do this slideshow. We're going to try a couple minutes of it. Uh, and if it doesn't work, we're, uh, we'll end on the note of asking everyone to please be here uh, for May 26, Memorial Day. Let's build this strong. Are you starting this? Yeah. Well, wait, it, wait. All right, just a second. Okay, you want to go back to the beginning? Or you, or you can't? I can't. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll say it afterwards. Um, maybe we'll just see how, if this will technically work. What's driving the U.S. confrontation with Russia over Ukraine? Well, we're technically challenged. Yeah. Yeah. Ukraine is located in Eastern Europe. It covers an area a little over 233,000 square miles, including Crimea, making it the largest country entirely within Europe. Ukraine borders Russia to the east and northeast, Belarus to the northwest, Poland, Slovakia, and Hungary to the west, Romania and Moldova to the southwest, the Black Sea on the south, and Sea of Azov to the southeast. Ukraine has a population of 45 million. It has lost 6 million people between the 1991 counter-revolution and the collapse of its currently capitalist economy, mostly due to immigration to Russia and Western Europe. This makes the Ukraine roughly equal to Spain in population in an area that is about 20% larger. In November of 2013, a protest movement in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, gained international attention Known as Euromain, it was promoted by Western media as a movement for democracy. The Euromain movement opposed the elected government of President Viktor Yanukovych. Yanukovych had balked at signing an agreement with the European Union. This agreement would have imposed U.S. and EU-backed neoliberal policies on Ukraine, an austerity program for Ukraine's workers resulting in more privatization, more layoffs, and severe cuts to social services. In addition to opening Ukraine up to domination by U.S. and European big business, the agreement would have given NATO the right to place military bases directly on Russia's western border. NATO, a military organization dominated by the U.S., has vastly expanded since 1991, moving eastward and circling the Russian Federation. Fascist organizations dominated the Euro Maiden Groups like Svoboda and Right Sector celebrate the fascist collaborator Stepan Bandera and promote racist, anti Semitic, anti Russian, and anti communist violence. U.S. officials were deeply involved in these events. Right-wing Senator John McCain visited Kiev on multiple occasions to encourage the fascists. And Obama administration appointee Victoria Nuland determined the lineup for the new pro-Washington regime. Nuland disclosed in a CNN interview that the U.S. had spent more than $5 billion promoting regime change.
In late February, Yanukovych was ousted in a violent coup. Arseny Yatsenyuk, handpicked by Ventor Victoria Nuland, appointed himself Prime Minister of Ukraine, and fascists were given six key ministries, including the military and interior ministries. This coup regime received immediate recognition from Washington. Violent neo-Nazi gangs ruled the streets of Kiev and other western Ukraine cities. They attacked and tortured opponents, vandalized and occupied offices of leftist organizations. They displayed racist and anti-Semitic banners in public buildings. Protests against the coup began immediately in southeastern Ukraine. The first act of the junta was to ban the Russian language, a language spoken by the majority in the southeast region. Crimea, a former Russian territory with a long-standing Russian military base, held a referendum on March 16, 2014. In this referendum, 97% of voters chose to leave Ukraine and instead affiliate with the Russian Federation. Following this, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry rushed to the junta's aid, delivering a $1 billion loan and promising up to $9 billion more. The U.S. and NATO also began a major military buildup, sending fighter planes and warships to the Black Sea and U.S. ground troops to Poland and the Baltics. In mid-March, to challenge the war buildup and the barrage of pro-war propaganda emanating from the White House and media, anti-war activists staged protests in 19 U.S. cities, demanding an end to U.S. intervention and no war in Ukraine or Russia. The actions also showed solidarity and support for the anti-fascist resistance. Opposition to the coup continued to grow throughout southeast Ukraine. The demand for a referendum on regional autonomy or independence galvanized people to fight back. April 6, 2014 was a day of coordinated actions by a broad coalition of anti-fascist groups. In Donetsk, government buildings were seized and an independent People's Republic of Donetsk was declared. Workers and retirees mobilized to defend the Donetsk People's Council. A referendum on the region's future status was set for May 11th. On the following day, April 7th, a People's Republic was declared. The People's Council there called for measures including protections for workers, renationalization of Soviet era industry, and a foreign policy that was free of NATO. National Guard troops, which now included the fascist street thugs from the Euromaiden protests, were dispatched by the Kiev junta and stormed the Kharkov Regional State Administration. Seventy activists were arrested. On April 12th, CIA Director John Brennan secretly visited Kiev. On the 15th of April, the junta launched what is called an anti-terror offensive against the rebellious Southeast.
The attempted military assault, a collapse and a humiliating defeat for Kiev. Troops deserted or refused to fight, turning over weapons and armored personnel carriers to the anti-fascist resistance. On May 2nd, the Kiev Junta unleashed fascist gangs in the city of Odessa. The fascists attacked an encampment set up by anti-Kiev protesters, setting it afire. When the anti-fascists sought refuge in the House of Trade Unions, fascists set the building ablaze, shooting into windows, beating, killing, and wounding anyone trying to attack. Many of those who survived were arrested. The fascists were allowed to leave. that they intend to move forward with the May 11th referendum on autonomy. 